So please welcome Matt. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Cherokee is the native language of the indigenous peoples of southeastern woodlands, uh, near the Great Smoky Mountains in present-day North Carolina and Tennessee. Its writing system, uh, seen here, consists of 85 characters, each representing not a letter, but a syllable. For example, here's how you'd write the script, uh, the language in its own script, Ja La Gi. Cherokee is among the most significant linguistic contributions of the American continent and a profound aesthetic achievement in its own right. It's also remarkable for being uh, created as recently as the 19th century and by a single person, no less. His name was Sequoia. He was born in Tuskegee around the same time that America was getting its independence. And in his 30s, he worked as a silversmith, trading with European and American soldiers, and eventually fighting alongside them in the War of 1812, like many Cherokee did at the time. As the story goes, one day Sequoia was t uh, talking to some soldiers, and they were recounting an incident where uh, they had captured a prisoner and found a message on his person. And having intercepted this message, they were able to anticipate an attack by the enemy. Now, Sequoia had no formal education. By all accounts, he was illiterate. But to him, so to him, that idea that somebody, anybody, could get that much meaning out of a piece of paper, he called them talking leaves. And one might think that they were kind of magic. Sequoia would spend the next decade trying to prove to himself to his family and to his community that it wasn't magic, but it was something that he could use to make his language even better. I love that story so much. Uh, my first encounter with the Cherokee language was at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh. In the Hall of Architecture, it was on a high school field trip. I remember looking up at the ceiling, and they have it installed as a permanent installation in the skylights. You see these beautiful, strange, and familiar characters against the sky. And I don't know, just something about that really stuck. Some years later, I'd uh, be at, you know, right up the, up the street at Carnegie Mellon, and I'd be dropping out of the computer science program there to study linguistics instead. It's complicated. <laughs> of course, I wasn't calling it quits on computers. I'm, I'm here right now talking about computers. Soon, soon. Um, but this background in linguistics, this love of language, is what gave me kind of a grounding in everything that would follow. Uh, so today is my privilege. I'm really, really excited to talk about my favorite subject with you. And I hope in do so doing, I can share some of that enthusiasm with you and hopefully demystify uh, some things about text encoding. It's not magic, but it's maybe the closest thing we have. I could ramble on endlessly about this, uh, but since we're limited to what, like, I don't know, I have 20 more minutes? Uh, I'm going to talk about seven different ways that you can think about strings in Swift. Uh, so let's get started with number one, collections of Unicode characters. This one's going to take a little bit of setup. Fundamentally, all written language attempts to solve the same problem, and that's representing the language separate from its essential, ephemeral, spoken or signed utterance. And what's so fascinating about written language is that it represents a universal problem. Every language has this problem, although not every spoken language has a written representation. It's a really hard problem. Many languages that do have written representations arrive at them independently and have done so, uh, you know, maybe sometimes arriving at the same patterns. Other times, the solutions they come up with are absolutely unique and surprising. For example, uh, this is true of the writing systems that became the Latin alphabet that we, under, that we know right now. Um, the Western writing systems uh, started from a pictorial prototype of an ox and then the Phoenician notation abstracted that ox, made it easier to write. Over time, that symbol became more and more abstract until the Greek letter alpha was just representing the sound, more or less, the word. Uh, and then it was purely phonetic by the time we saw it and learned it in grade school with a capital letter A. Actually, one last note. Let's go back. Um, fun, fun fact, uh, the ox uh, is pronounced alp, and because uh, Oxes are generally in front of carts. They're the leader. It's, a, it's sort of a synonym for leader, which is why alpha is the first letter of the alphabet. It's pretty cool. So anytime you look at the letter A, think of an ox. Also, you ever wonder why it's called the alphabet? It's just the first two letters of the Greek al alphabet, alpha, beta. Hmm? Mind-blowing stuff. 
By a similar process, Eastern writing systems evolved from pictorial representations, uh, although in the case of Chinese, they didn't become an alphabet. They became this logographic writing system, which is uh, absolutely amazing. Very difficult to learn, but, you know, extraordinary. So we define a character as the fundamental unit of a writing system, the atomic unit. And we can categorize all writing systems based on what that unit signifies. So for an ideogram, for an ideographic writing system, each character represents one idea. For a logogram, for a logographic system, each character is a word. Alphabets say that one character is one sound, or a phoneme. Abugidas, they say, let's combine those. It's a consonant plus a vowel. Abjads say, we don't need vowels, just consonants. Syllables, uh, as syllabaries, as the name suggests, they represent each character as a syllable. Or a mora, if you want to be technical, because in Japanese, for instance, uh, one character is a mora, so like the to in Tokyo, that's two mora because you're holding it out, but it's still a single syllable. So to put this into a broader context, here's an overview of real world uh, writing systems and in their classifications. At the very top, we have uh, the Latin alphabet, which is the most widely used writing system in the world. Six billion people use that every day. Uh, afterwards, we have uh, Cyrillic following that, Greek, uh, Armenian, Korean, all alphabet systems, all different in their own way. And then we have abjads, which are mostly used by the Perso-Arabic or Semitic scripts. Uh, so we have Arabic and Hebrew and, and Farsi or Persian uh, script, Urdu, all those languages. Uh, those are spoken by maybe six, seven hundred million uh, people in the world. Abugidas, uh, the biggest one is Devanagari, spoken, uh, used in Hindi. Uh, and then you have related scripts like Tamil, uh, uh, Telugu. Uh, you have syllabaries, like Japanese hiragana and katakana, and of course, Cherokee. And then you have logograms, both traditional and simplified Chinese characters, which are used in the, the Chinese languages, and as, as well as uh, Japanese, Korean, and, and Vietnamese. Uh, of course, those are logograms. Those characters, although some of them represent ideas, and they're really just words. Uh, if you want pure ideograms, you've got to look at something as recent as emoji, or other symbols like wingdings. So the relationship between language and computers runs deep. Uh, traditionally, a byte was defined as the number of bits that you needed to represent a character in a comp particular computer, uh, hence the char type in the C language. Uh, there's no such thing as plain text, though. Uh, you're not going to, for instance, sever an Ethernet cord and watch as some letters and numbers spill out. It's all numbers, although you won't really see numbers either. It's just light. That's a different subject. Uh, but the point is that it's, there's no such thing, there's no inherent meaning to the numbers. What we do, need to do is create an encoding to give that meaning. And ASCII was the first standardized encoding that was used for computers. And most of you are probably already aware of this, at least by name. ASCII is pretty ubiquitous, even though it's not really used as much these days. Uh, in seven bits, ASCII encodes 95 printing characters, in addition to the control characters, the first 32 bits in the beginning, and uh, delete at the end. Now notice how the lowercase and uppercase characters are separated by just a single bit. That's a really nice design feature of this, because in early printers and typewriters, uh, it made it really easy to do case-insensitive comparisons. So there's like some good intention in how that was designed. So using ASCII, you can represent the string hello uh, as a series of bytes. So the seven bits occupy the byte with one bit remaining, uh, and then you have a null terminator at the end. Uh, but not long after ASCII was standardized, other countries started asking some questions, like uh, the Danish are like, what about our vowels? And uh, the Japanese are like, can I please have a yen key? So uh, we, uh, the, the standards bodies came up with ISO 646. Uh, and what it did is it created blank spaces for some of the lesser used characters and ASCII and just said, all right, national standards, you can put in whatever you need. And so they did. Uh, for instance, German got its umlauts in their vowels. They decided that they didn't need brackets. Uh, and Japan got its yen key. They overrode the backslash, which still continues to cause problems in DOS and Windows systems. <laughs> And for me, too, I use a Japanese keyboard, and for whatever reason, the backspace or the backslash key is still producing yen. I have to override that, and it's annoying. Uh, so that's, that's a fun thing. If I were to represent the state of text at computing at this point, uh, Jackson Pollock seems like a good uh, you know, allegory. It's, it's beautiful, 
but chaotic. Not great. In an attempt to reconcile these differences, once and for all, uh, the standards bodies came up with ISO 8859. That was in 1987. Their solution was to divide up uh, the standard, not one standard, but 16 standards of bilingual translations between different scripts. Uh, mostly the pairs were Latin to something else, uh, but it was supposed to uh, allow for communication within different languages. However, it's still 8-bit. And there are only so many numbers that can fit in there. I mean, specifically, there are 255 numbers plus null. So not, that's not many. In fact, from the very start, you're already making compromises. These letters that you see, those were not representable by this encoding. And they're not the most you know, widely used characters. But like, I don't know, capital et set? I, I, I think I remember that from German class. I'm pretty sure we'd miss that. Like, it's, it's hard to imagine like, not being able to type like, the letter Y. It's like, okay, we're just gonna have to, or the, like a W. We're just gonna have to make do with two U's. No, those are separate things. Uh, so from the start, it was kind of doomed. Uh, it allowed for bilingual communication, so between Latin and Arabic, for instance, but you couldn't, for example, have a document that had both Arabic and Turkish uh, scripts. So the Ottoman Empire used to use a Perso-Arabic script until it was replaced by Latin script in 1928. Uh, if you wanted to like, transcribe documents in that transition period, it was impossible. You could represent one with Latin 6 and the other with Latin 5, but you couldn't have the two together, which um, kind of, it's a bummer for scholars, right? But none of those compares to the problem of uh, representing Chinese characters. By all accounts, there are at least 100,000 of them, which is much, much more than 256, much more than can be represented in a single byte, much more than two bytes. So what are we doing? We're trying, to, we're, we're trying to create an encoding system that can't represent a uh, script used by over a billion people. Yeah, OK. So at this point, this is also during the time of the birth of the web. Can you imagine a web where you weren't actually able to communicate with people? Like, that's not, that's not the World Wide Web. That's just your local neighborhood web. That's not, that's not as compelling. I guess that wouldn't have three Ws, which I've always found that to be difficult. Um, that's the backstory, the why and the how of how Unicode was created. That was in 1991. Unicode defines a code space that's divided up into 17 planes. Uh, you have the basic multilingual plane, that's where most of the characters that we use every day are, and then you have supplementary planes. Uh, that's the Unicode code space, 17 times, uh, what, 65,000 to those, what was that, 16? I'm gonna embarrass myself trying to do this live. Um, that's like a million. Uh, over a million. And right now we're using about 10% of that. So we got plenty of room to grow. We're not running out of characters. Certainly not running out of numbers, but the numbers that are allocated, we're good for now. And Unicode supersedes all other text encodings and offers compatibility with them. So it's really trying to be the one standard to rule them all. And it's succeeded in that respect. Although I guess technically it's not an encoding format. So Unicode divides up and numbers the characters, but it doesn't actually prescribe any particular encoding. That's what these are. If you've ever seen UTF-8, 16, and 32, those are the text encodings of Unicode. Uh, and they give you your, uh, a variety of flavors, 8, 16, and 32-bit. Uh, UTF-8 is the most widely used. It became popular because it was compatible with ASCII. The first uh, seven bits of it are just one-to-one -one mapping. And then from there, you, uh, it, it makes it really easy to uh, represent text in a compact way. Uh, 32, that's way more uh, than you need to represent the million or so characters in Unicode, but uh, you know, that's uh, a multiple uh, that's suitable, so you often see that in coding. 16 is sort of a compromise between the two and has its own quirks. Uh, some terminology uh, to help, that's helpful to get uh, a little bit of understanding. A string is a collection of characters. A character consists of one or more Unicode scalars. So those are code points that actually correspond to something you might actually see. Uh, and then characters are encoded into a sequence of bytes. So strings are characters, characters have scalars, and the characters can be encoded into bytes, and that's how they're transmitted. In Swift 4, finally, code, uh, strings are collections of characters. That didn't used to be the case, but that's what it is now. Uh, you can iterate over them um, in a for loop. So if you do for character and string, uh, you'll get what you expect. For the purpose of computers, a character is what you expect to be deleted when you hit backspace. I think that's probably the best explanation that I've ever heard. Um, the, the term extended grapheme cluster comes up, but that's not, I don't think those are words. <laughs> so you get the, this. That's the output if you run the program from before and you're iterating over the characters. 
Of course, uh, Swift provides different views into the different encodings. Uh, sorry, that's premature. Uh, as we mentioned before, some characters consist of multiple Unicode scalars. Uh, lowercase e, acute, can be created by a lowercase letter e plus a combining accent, acute. Um, alternatively, some of these combinations have normalized forms that consist of a single character. So there's a normalization aspect to it. That's a complication. Uh, not going to get into it here, but that's just something to look out for. Um, all of this sort of builds to the point that you, this is the reason why that doesn't work. Uh, when, in order to find out how long a, a Unicode string is, you actually have to go through it all. You can't just arbitrarily say, OK, the, second char the third character in here is going to be an index two. What, what is a character? It could, you don't know how many code points there are going to be until you've counted up to that point. So if you ever wondered why Swift is trying to be overly pedantic with your int-based uh, accessing, that's why. You really shouldn't be able to do that. So Swift strings are opaque collection types, because they, but they offer different views. Uh, if you wanted to get a better sense of what's actually going on in your string, you can access the UTF-8, UTF-16, and Unicode scalars, which is pretty much a UTF-32 uh, representation. Go and print out those, uh, the, the bytes in the case of UTF-8 and UTF-16, or in the case of the scalar, just the value. And you'll produce a table like this. So you can notice that the original ASCII characters, like capital letter C and A and F, those can be represented by a single code point. The, with the accent, that's also a single code point. That could have been two code points. It could have been the combined form, but this is the normalized form of that. Uh, that's represented by two UTF-8 characters. Uh, space, that's another original ASCII character. And then emoji, that's way up there. That's not even in the, 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 the BMP. That's the, it's not in the basic multilingual plane. So that's going to be a high number. You need four UTF-8 bytes in order to represent that. We're going to talk more about Unicode throughout the talk. But for now, I just want to switch gears for a moment and talk about identifiers. Uh, so let's say you have a product. And it has, among other things, an identifier, which happens to be a string. The problem with using a string for identifier is that the API surface area is enormous. So if you start to type out things, uh, all of a sudden you get autocomplete with like hundreds and hundreds of methods, right? That's, that's, that's annoying, but also indicative of, a, of an API, of an opportunity to create a better API. So you don't want to expose your type in for your, your, your types to that sort of uh, complication, right? Everything that we just talked about, all the complexity of the language, insulate them by creating another type yourself. A better approach here would be to create a nested identifier type in the product. Uh, and then that has an underlying string value, may or may not be private, but uh, that at least encapsulates the complexity there. As of Swift 4.1, equatable and hashable components are automatically synthesized. There's less overhead, so you can just do the right thing. As currently implemented, the shortcomings of the approach is that it's more cumbersome. Nobody wants uh, to type all of this out, and you can't expect them to either. I mean, when given the choice between what's convenient and what's correct, most people, you know, it's going to break down. So why not just make the correct solution more convenient? Well, Swift lets you do that. Uh, the killer feature of Swift, uh, the string type, is the string literal, the ability to just declare values right there in the code. Uh, fortunately, Swift lets us, uh, lets our common types, uh, our custom types, uh, take advantage of that. All we have to do is conformed to the expressible by string literal protocol. For a type that just wraps a single string value, this is a trivial implementation. You just pass it into the initializer you already had. Now we get the convenience of strings with the safety of our encapsulated type. So now we can do this, or uh, more simply, this. Because our uh, initializer for a product infers the type of the identifier, uh, the, the, the string literal gets interpreted correctly. Everything compiles. Good stuff. And again, the surface area for our encapsulated type, much smaller. If we start to type that out, the autocomplete, it's only going to show you the stuff for hashable. It's great. You could type things a step further and maybe create a, uh, a type that's not nested. Maybe it's generic, so you allow for string and integer uh, identifier types. It's crazy. Go, go wild. Um, but really, a custom identifier type makes more sense than a bare string in a lot of ways. If you think about it, any identifying uh, piece of information, like right, a credit card number or a barcode or a URL, uh, they all have representations, but there are restrictions for what values are valid, and maybe there are some different uh, rules about how they're represented. So in that case, uh, 
your initializer for your encapsulated type, that's a great opportunity to do validation. Here, uh, we should probably be using throws instead of fatal error, but this gets the point across pretty well. Uh, here, we're validating that the string that we use as an identifier isn't blank, it's not too long, and in this case, I guess, uh, is only composed of food emoji. So you might also normalize an identifier. So different example, you might just make it all lower cased. Or alternatively, you might optimize uh, your, implement an optimized cased uh, insensitive comparison uh, operator for your identifier and sort of bypass all of the Unicode stuff when you're comparing things. So speaking of the URLs, let's talk about paths. Uh, URLs aren't strictly speaking strings, uh, but strings comprise their components. RFC 3986 defines the rules for the structure of URLs as well as what characters are allowed at what positions. If you were to put a colon uh, somewhere in the host name, that would be interpreted as a port. That's not allowed. If you're working with URLs, uh, Foundation has an excellent set of APIs, and you should be using those. Uh, the URL type is great, uh, and the URL components type is even better. It's flexible, and it allows you to manipulate different components uh, in a really nice way. Here, we're setting the path of a base URL. Great, works, works as expected. Uh, URLs are limited in what kinds of characters they can contain. Uh, think ASCII, right? Everything else has to be percent encoded or URI encoded. If you were, for example, to attempt to add an emoji as a path component, uh, that character ne would need to be percent encoded. So here, if we wanted to be really clever, instead of NYC, use the Statue of Liberty emoji, uh, it would produce the URL that you see below. Uh, so URL components is automatically encoding that because you use that accessor. Uh, percent encoding represents out-of-range characters as a sequence of UTF-8 bytes in hexadecimal. Uh, so if we take F0, 9F, 97, and BD, what we get, there we go, we get it back. So that's the Statue of Liberty character as originally encoded. That's what percent encoding is. Anytime you see like percent 20 or 26 or anything in your URLs, that's what's going on. Uh, next up, let's talk about natural language text, or just strings that contain text that is either written by humans or for humans, uh, written language in its essential form. Uh, new in iOS 12 and macOS Mojave, uh, the natural language frameworks normalizes and uh, reorganizes and expands on the existing APIs with smarter machine learning based uh, internals. The functionality of Foundation's NS Linguistic Tagger has been split, thank goodness, into three separate APIs, NL Tokenizer, NL Tagger, and NL Language Recognizer. I'm just gonna go through those really quick. Uh, you can use NL Tokenizer to do tokenization, which is dividing up text into components. You have paragraphs, sentences, and words. You might think yourself clever if you wanted to, as an English speaker, say, tokenization, no problem. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this functional programming stuff to split it and then just uh, whatever. It's not gonna work. So, because if I hit you with this string in Chinese that was written on a Windows computer, it's not gonna work. Chinese script doesn't use spaces to limit their words, they don't use the same period character, and Windows, you know, they have those different line endings. <laughs> but my app is only sold for Americans and an English-speaking audience. There's no such thing as English. That's a weird statement, but there's no such thing as the English that you know. Like, it's, it's an international language there, there's no restrictions on what text can be, just expect everything. Here's the correct way to use, uh, tokenize a string using NL tokenizer. Uh, the API is simple enough. Uh, it's kind of boring to talk through code. You can see it up in the slides later if you'd like. Uh, another important NLP technique is tagging, and you can do that with NL tagger. Uh, you could do part of speech tagging in a sentence. Uh, again, kind of what you'd expect. Uh, and when you run that, you get tags like you know, the, that's a determiner, or quick, that's an adjective. Uh, in addition to lexical classes, one of the cooler things that uh, this can do is it can do lemmas, uh, lemmatization, so the word jumped can become the word jump, which is really nice if you want to normalize things for further processing. Another form of tagging is named entity recognition. Using NL tagger, you can get the names of people, places, and organizations from a string. Uh, I'm not even including the enumerate call because it's kind of the same, but you get the idea. Uh, from that string, you get like Tim Cook and Apple Inc. in Cupertino, California. It's great, wonderful. Uh, one of the new features though of NL Tagger is the ability to make your own models. So you can use CreateML. I think there are at least one talk about that before. You can create your own model. Uh, so for instance, if you wanted to tag Apple products in your string, uh, you can do that. Uh, you just create an NL model object from your ML model. That's not confusing. Uh, define a tag scheme and then associate it with your tagger and then bada bing, you get it. It's great, Apple symbols. Uh, 
So transliteration, last thing I want to touch on briefly, uh, language, natural language processing tax is, is transliteration. Uh, it's the process of transforming text into another equivalent or derived representation. A common example of this is stripping diacritics or uh, accents or other characters, cleaning it up. Uh, this is provided by the, the, by the foundation string method applying transform. It can do a lot of other things. So one of the more useful ones is uh, to Latin transliteration. And you can convert pretty much any script into Latin using transliteration rules. If you have Korean text and you don't have the 30 minutes, literally 30 minutes that it takes to learn Korean text, it's amazing, uh, you can instead just use this shortcut, easy. And now you have some idea of how to pronounce this thing if you don't speak Korean. Uh, I've used this in the past, uh, this technique, to, as a way to get full text uh, multilingual search uh, locally with the Core Data database. Uh, so by transliterating all text that goes into the, into the data store and then all search queries, you don't, doesn't matter any, uh, whatever language somebody's using, you have a fighting chance at them getting results. Doesn't matter what the language is. Uh, number five, uh, let's talk about structured data. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as natural language processing, but different. Uh, so text often contains information like dates and locations and phone numbers. Uh, you, there's another foundation API you can use called NS Data Detector, and you can extract the structured information from text and get the dates, address, components, phone numbers, URLs, and flight information. Uh, the API is straightforward. You have a string. You have a data detector. Uh, it's a lot of effort to create a range from the string, but you pass that in, uh, and then you just uh, evaluate this closure for each match that happens. When you run it on the, the code there, you get what you expect. You get a date. It actually detects the time zone, too, if you had that. Uh, it gives you a, a, an address, however many components are provided, and the URL. This is great. So the next time that you're working with natural language text and you want to get some information out of it, this is a great approach. Uh, it's not a great approach, though, if you have structured information and you want to send it over the wire, and you're not really sure about the API boundaries. Uh, so let's talk about number six, encoded data. Uh, one workaround to encoding binary data uh, is to encode binary data as, as text, because most systems get text right, at least have some fighting chance. We're familiar with encoding from the start of the talk, so it's easy to understand now uh, base64 encoding. We have 64 possible characters, and we're representing a single byte from that. Uh, a general strategy is to choose uh, 64 characters that are printable, uh, and common to most encodings. So you have data, it's, you're unlikely to lose data along the way. Uh, basically, A through Z, capital lowercase, zero through nine, and we need two more, so I guess plus and slash. Uh, here's a string, and here's the base64 encoding of that UTF data, UTF-8 data. Uh, base64 isn't a particularly efficient way to encode it, so don't use it to solve any of your space issues, but it's just to give you an idea of the comparison. Uh, foundation provides methods for base64 encoding uh, strings in Swift. Here's an example of doing that round trip and coding and decoding the same string. So what are some practical examples? Uh, well, you see base64 a lot uh, when you work in mail. Uh, if you're writing an email with multiple parts, like attachments, uh, all of that might be encoded using base64. Or in web development, you can reduce the number of web requests that you make to the server by base64 encoding images or fonts in a CSS file. So the next time you want to bulletproof something that you're displaying in a web view, base64 encoding can be a great uh, alternative to bundling a bunch of files and then worrying about paths resolving correctly. Uh, and if you're averse to using the asset catalog or the resources folder in Playgrounds for whatever reason, or you just want to you know, put everything in the same source file, this is another technique you can use to embed, like let's say a ping into your source. And we're going to talk, uh, finish this talk with a quick discussion about typography. Uh, so this whole time, uh, I guess I could have mentioned this at the asset. Uh, we were just talking about characters as abstract things. Uh, that's a separate process than what you actually see. Those are known as glyphs. And the process of transforming characters into glyphs is something called glyph shaping. And it's a totally different process. Uh, so for example, capital letter A, uh, it's a code point that's a character. Uh, when typesetting software encounters it, it will render it differently depending on the font or other factors. So one example is uh, in, in Arabic, for instance. Some writing system, the, the, the appearance of the character depends on its context. Uh, the glyph depends on this position in the word. We also have the same thing in English uh, uh, with, with ligatures. So if you have the 
characters F, F, and I, some, some fonts will turn that into a single character to make it more legible. But by far the most interesting examples of uh, glyph shaping come from, of course, emoji. Instead of having, if you ever wondered like how there's so many flags in emoji and how they just showed up all at once, they're not like 200 characters. They're just 20, they're combinations of two, 26, uh, two of 26 characters. And uh, so you have regional indicator U plus regional indicator S, US, that's America. That's an ISO 3166 code. So it's all standardized. Um, other flags work differently though. So you can create the pride flag by combining the white flag plus the zero width joiner plus the rainbow and then create a rainbow flag. Or in Unicode 11, you can do black flag plus zero width joiner plus skull and crossbones and you get the Jolly Roger pirate flag. Uh, Mojave doesn't have this yet, so that's a fake one. <laughs> However, oh, this is so worrying and frustrating. Um, some companies are making their own combinations. So on any normal platform, cat face plus zero width joiner plus computer equals cat face computer. On Microsoft platforms, though, you get <laughs> Hacker Cat. Good grief. Um, between this and <laughs> the looming threat of frowning pile of poo and the inevitable expression, that was a proposal that was rejected, thank goodness, but it's gonna keep coming. Expressions are gonna come to poo-shaped emoji. We have to fight against that. <laughs> the survival of language depends upon it. I am not joking. 10 years ago, I don't think anybody would have predicted that the iPhone would usher in a new ideographic paradigm in, of language. The Unicode Consortium went from being a standards body that was doing its work quietly to being the clearinghouse of all human communication. What the, what happened? <laughs> Looking forward, this is what I have to conclude. <laughs> it, time is a flat circle. Civilization is over. We are, I am, the, Rome is burning. Human communication is doomed. Um, uh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, just a couple quick plugs. Uh, happy to say, NS Hipster, it's now available in Korean. Any Korean speakers in the audience? Hooray! Come on, Uh Korean, enjoy. NSHipster.co.kr. Yay! That's not it. Yes. Uh, uh, Pilgwan, my translator, he's amazing. I think, I don't speak Korean. Um, I write a series of books called Flight School. I have one on codable and I have one on numbers. If you wanted the same kind of treatment for numbers, uh, please check it out. Those are new covers, uh, those are coming soon. Uh, I also am in the process of writing a book about strings. A lot of stuff I didn't cover. Would really hope that you consider buying this book when it comes out. Uh, aren't those covers great? Uh, follow flight.school. Uh, you will get updates as soon as I actually have updated the website or anything uh, for that announcement. It's coming soon. I'm really excited. Thank you again so much. Thank you.